Thank you for this lovely introduction. Uh, I would like to um, talk about my work a bit more globally rather than showing particular projects because I am in this uh, profession now for three decades. And actually already when um, I graduated uh, in 1989, already we knew that there was the current building culture particularly in the post-industrialized uh, countries, the developed countries as we call them, that the building habits are creating often more problems than they solve is something I had suspected when I graduated already. And I feel that since that time, we were that at that time the word sustainability was not really coined in that sense, but people were talking about the panic about the resources ending you know, but we come from old civilizations where we did not see the things in any case as a linear thing. And I did not see sustainability as something new, but I detected that it is the post-industrial habits that are not sustainable. So I wanted more to talk about non-sustainability of only the last hundred year habits rather than talk about sustainability. And that's how I approached the topic because I found it more scientific to talk about what is not sustainable than to talk about what is sustainable because however simple we live, we are going to need some resources. So for me, it was the other way to look at it. And then I wanted to counter the panic of finite resources by, by bringing to attention why talk only about natural resources? Those are finite. Why are we not talking about human resources which are infinite? So I started to dwell on this point and I realized that for me it's very clear that because of industrialization, we had coined this term, time is money. Let's save time, let's save time of human, human engagement, human muscle, everything human, cut back, don't engage outsource it to machines, and we have gone outside the human scale of how much material we extract, etc. So I was interested in the subtleties and in the human versus machine dilemma. And I today am even more convinced that if you want to save so much time to do things, at what cost have we saved the time? Are we enjoying more? Do we have more time today? Or do we have more stress today? How expensive was it to save the human time if you pay the real cost of the impact of saving time? So I feel, and I would like to talk about that today, is instead of talking about the uh, scarcity of resources, I want to talk about the idea of celebrating and promoting human resources, human intelligence, human ingenuity, human uh, time, care, all the human quality. Let us proactively use them to have a better life. If you look at old architecture anywhere in the world, humans have built with whatever existed. When we talk about territory, we are not talking only about how architecture impacts the territory, but the very sourcing of the material impacts the territory. And if you look at old architecture, which we used to admire all over the world, including Notre Dame here, it is these are time-intensive methods, but all the time we managed hum to reflect through the architecture that the human being is in fact evolving, becoming more clever. Up until the time of Bauhaus, we have managed that with the same materials we had around us, some people have stone, some people have mud, we did not judge if a material is good or bad morally. We have what we, the earth is made of many things and we make shelter with it. And including if there is nothing we have to build with ice, you build with ice, you build with anything you have. So humans showed the way human resources engaged with the material. I would like to talk about that. In general, I would like that to become the discussion to talk about how are humans behaving vis-a-vis -vis material and not talk about the material as if they are external to us. So, um, 
Here you see that even if you make a dress, a sari, it can take four months or it can take one day. So if it, or it can take a very complex hand rendering to make an iconic building. And you can use stone more simply for the everyday use. So it's the richness and luxury comes from the human engagement and not if the material is posh or not. So actually, um, I want to just uh, mention here that the, the, the standardized product that the housing has become has become so high that even in developed countries today, it cannot be afforded without more than half of your salary going towards a house. So imagine in other countries that are still colonized by the Western approach to producing mass-produced standardized components, we are producing a very big polarity worldwide between the, the industrialized standard product where you don't know whose home is whose and what and you're lost. So we don't know which one is more oppressive almost because pe people live in two cities. Those who can afford and don't, those who can afford or can't afford are equally miserable because a human being is not doing well in, in the middle of all this. So all the building material culture that we have had in every, like we have so many different climates and we have so many different uh, uh, materials under our feet. We have, where we have wood, we, we use, we develop that. And if you're in the desert, you have to build with domes and with what materials you have according to only one factor which is the common ground. The Homo sapiens have not changed so much in the last hundred years in, its, in our biology or our comfort needs or any needs. There is no need that some, some species require, or some of the same species require dramatically more resources. It's not like that to survive and thrive. Similarly, the climate and the force of gravity, these are realities and that's all there is. And all over the world, we have therefore diverse building cultures, but now everything is the same. Everything is reinforced concrete and even the bricks you see are no longer allowed to carry weight because we humans have created laws, nothing to do with universal laws. We have codes which don't allow us to build how our grandparents built. So everywhere nowadays, all over the world, even in Australia, bricks are not allowed to carry weight. They are for decoration, to fill things. It's ridiculous. It's an insult to the human uh, intelligence, I think. So I used to ask myself, what is this chasing for efficiency? What is the point of doing efficiently well the things that need not be done at all? I often ask myself this even today. And through that kind of questioning, I started understanding the what I explained about how materials, when they are begin to as architects to see, not from the material catalog, but how are materials sourced? What impact does that have on the society and their activities? Like when people used to make bricks, the, the firing of the brick kilns used to occur um, through cutting down, um, you know, the thinnings of the forest, which they have them, I mean, it's not, they would plant, the, the reforested areas were part of their life cycle of what the activities they did. And they would make bricks in the season when the clay collects after the monsoon. And when that's not happening, they are farmers growing rice. So if you just don't, if you start making the material production outsourced into the brick factories, all the other activities get, or the entire interdependencies are broken, and the brick is neither affordable, but also not as uh, energy-wise affordable, because these brick kilns, they get baked, and this brick stack is the brick kiln. And when you finish, it's again a landscape. But now we have to build huge factories, make huge bricks, and we have to, each of these things, which were all being done by a human community in a territory, are all going to be disrupted. Uh, people who make lime because they have only that much lime. You know, we have to now, because we don't know how to use the clay. Because why? The clay is different in my area and your area. 
So we don't know how to use the lime because you have to calculate all those things. We have to know so many more things. We, we, our grandparents used to know widespread so many more things, but we want to be standardized and we want to not know those things. So we prefer to use Portland cement because then I have to learn only one thing. And we are wiping out all that micro material culture and micro decisions to in favor of standard practices and all of this is getting wiped out and the cost of that brick now in all the green rating systems is supposed to be very high the brick burning cost but that's because they they only count the industrial brick and not the the way this brick is produced so i personally do not subscribe to even those rating systems because there is only qu quantitative kilojoules figure no qualitative whether it's human energy whether it is a coconut shell so all of this has to be seen and entire communities are wiped out as we speak and the knowledge is being wiped out as we speak so initially when i started my profession with buildings i just tried to do a very simple thing i knew deeply that the material i have under me must be cheaper if i eat my own mango from my tree it must be cheaper but the whole world is telling you that it's easier to not eat your own mango but to eat it in germany for some reason and cashew nuts and everything so i just because i don't believe this uh, i started to do this and i found out that if you actually do the math and you don't believe just because somebody said to that it is so if you start counting the exact thing you find out that it's actually not even true most of the people don't know themselves but they have the conviction in what they are saying so if you just do building by building it looks like a slow process if you take your own time to think but in fact each building you do it empowers you to ask more questions to find out more and i'm myself surprised in 30 years the amount of things i have done almost in 10 years or so i think 100 buildings or so we it goes fast actually if because you lose your fear to operate in a f illusion of certainty when in fact even the rectangular wall is not rectangular we know but at least we who come from the handmade culture we measure every diagonal it's a culture of building that we have to change i feel you know and the culture of not questioning so beginning with the territory and looking at how humans were still extracting materials even by hand or whatever i started to use those skills in contemporary design but putting all the attention on the skills and uh, making that uh, instead of calling this artisans poor but making the skill the luxury and giving Uh, respect to the things that were created and one of the early works that i had done was to uh, give the potters community a guaranteed livelihood instead of losing jobs due to urbanization and so you know through through relying on engineering and literally on knowledge actually um, and chasing it i managed to i think uh, find many uh, advantages in in creating architecture with whatever we have and instead of feeling thinking about poverty because instead of focusing on trying to build with what we don't have if you just build with what there is abundance of if there is a lot of people without work use the people if there is a lot of material try to use it or create ways to use it if you celebrate what you have abundance of then you create abundance and you don't create debts so through this i um, started to produce uh, i don't know from city thinking to product design <laughs> you see when i started my look i was 23 years old starting an office you can see all what you what the ignorance is all over the face you can see that and what i want to say is that we don't need to be blocked because we don't know everything it's very important that to not be restricted to what we know what we know is not going to be useful for the future the future is happening so fast the wanting to know is the point so imagination is more important than the knowledge once you have the imagination you will want to get the knowledge and then you will get the knowledge so here i thought there was nothing but today i looked at this picture and i think oh there is a lot i see the foreground is a building material the background is a human skill for me this was a random photograph i had now i see that all the clues are in every image of a place 
And through this kind of building, we, we, we continued the methods of building by, by producing, not in factories, but producing in a manner that the people could still do their farming, they could do whatever it is they are doing and produce small quantities within the human scale, build housing with that. And the housing, uh, and all the questions you don't know, mostly engineers were telling me at that time, this cannot be done, that cannot be done. And I used to think, oh, if you, it cannot be done, then you, what you need to change is the engineer, because it has been done. If you cannot do it, means you don't know how to do it. I was very young, so I could not say that. So I used to go to my craftsmen and masons who did not have that fear. So we used to do load tests, and each of the obstacles we found, it allowed us and empowered us to be more capable to do the next thing. So I built all kinds of buildings, and in all these cases, you see the brick is again the pre-industrial brick, because we used to consider them the weak brick and the Louis Kahn bricks, the good bricks, you know. And then we later, later on I realized that the bad bricks are the good bricks. I have to use it in a way that the aesthetic of the imperfection can be celebrated instead of feeling apologetic compared to the European brickwork, you know. And um, little by little, um, I don't even know where the architecture ends, who is involved, how many hands are involved. Everybody's involved. I realized everybody's involved in architecture, in either producing architecture or in, in using, uh, living in it. So the materiality, which is the problem of our times, is affected, it's affecting all those who create the architecture, and the voids are designed for, the, for us to inhabit. So both all are affected. Here is a case where I started using ceramic uh, work of the potters also for form work, for concrete to be used at about maybe 30% of the steel that you need to use or reducing the volume. Efficient form, uh, concrete needs f efficient form work. And it's not being used in our times only because we are lazy to make complicated form work. So I started making cost-effective form work. It, this, these are small spans. These were tested in order to produce, um, you know, I started uh, designing for in my small houses a, a, ideas for building, creating a building language because I was in Auroville and there was a city to be built. So I wanted to create a whole palette of technologies to be able to, when you don't need, where you need insulation, where you don't need insulation, what is the purpose, what kind of spans, what can be used. And through this, and with this ferro cement doors and other material I explored, I started producing the architecture which looks like that. And unfortunately, because it looks so much embedded into the thing, uh, to the local area, people started calling my work vernacular. I'm still under the vernacular label, you know. It's okay, I don't think vernacular is bad, but it is, the people do not have any more the eye. They don't know enough about maybe the engineering to even recognize the engineering. So I think it's become that quick um, production, like not thinking about the building technology has become kind of a sign of the times, you know. But you see, so, while I was building, that, is my, that was my own house actually, in case you all will come there, I can show you. Um, but uh, this one was the hut in which I lived for 10 years when I went to Auroville. So this is built out of round wood. And in fact, I think my motorbike was probably more expensive than, uh, than the house, you know. Um, it, it had also solar panels, which was also as expensive as the house. But uh, basically what I learned by living in this kind of methods is that, uh, again, round wood, uh, round wood, if you use the cross section, a three-year-old tree will give you what maybe a 25-year-old will give you if you cut it into rectangle. Why do we have to cut it into rectangle so that it's easy for the person to draw 100 times that same use, you know? Or for, so these are little subtle things which don't get talked about when we look at green buildings. I realized that those, that is what it's all about. And I started finding a way to build and live with those very basic questions of negotiating between handmade, machine-made, um, high-tech, low-tech. And I even wonder why those things which we are doing, which are so complicated to calculate, why are they being even called low-tech and all the, the other one being called high-tech? If two words, it should be the other way around. So anyhow, so... Then I started involving also, you know, users and, and trying, to, you know, in co-housing projects, trying to always design something where technologies do not alienate people 
and to build in a way that everybody can contribute and be able to afford if they have time. Even to take a bank loan, you should be able to do something with your own time to get the equity, sweat equity, you know. So all of these ideas came very, very um, naturally through common sense, actually, because like the emperor's new clothes syndrome, I thought it's important to question what nobody is questioning. And even if 100 people are saying one thing opposite to you, doesn't mean they are right necessarily. So uh, just pursue the questions. And you know that led to all this type of architecture. Um, here I was trying to make uh, more kind of like uh, urban, urban uh, connections, etc., cetera, for, for the Auroville urban design. So um, meanwhile, the probably the most radical project I did was to bake in situ mud houses. So in this technique, uh, uh, pursuing uh, pi the pioneer of this te technology, Ray Meeker, I did my PhD on this um, topic, and I had built a few houses in that technology. What it involves is, as I told you, oh no, I didn't pro when, when you make bricks in a factory, 40% of the heat you generate goes into the wall again and again. But if you, whereas the kilns that we have on site, as I said, were the outer bricks, if they're not cooked so well, they are still used inside the wall or somewhere else, you know. These small efficiencies uh, led to this type of approach where we thought that if you build a house, which is a kiln, inside which the bricks are cooked, then the house can get cooked for free. You build a earth wall with mud mortar, and you see there is holes to fire it like a kiln. The house is designed like a kiln. Then you fill it up with bricks, and you cook the whole thing, and you don't even need cement. Three or four days later, the whole house is cooked. Your fire is the cement. So these were very radical ideas, and actually all of these works, I feel I'm telling you all now because of this moment I have the prize, but this was all done in my first 10 years already, this type of things, you know? And um, so now I'm more into doing urban, bigger projects, but so this kind of detailed thinking about materials is I feel where if the, uh, it's materiality today that is in question, we need to go into the nuts and bolts to find out where the energy implications are. And I don't think architects can afford to not know about all these things. So um, anyhow, so what happens is then the house is baked, then you take out the bricks, and you can make any sizes, you can do whatever you want, you can uh, fill it with other products like, you know, this is Ray Meeker's uh, work, uh, you know, where he built toilet pans, wash basins, uh, tiles. There's so much ceramic, you know, in architecture, pipes, all kinds of things. He would cook all of that. So you, instead of the housing becoming a consumer of materials, it becomes a producer of local materials. And um, it was seen in that sense. And so this, this project was Homes for Homeless Children. So I also discovered through the engineering that if you don't, if you use this type of forms, then you can actually avoid to have walls. And if you can have them so thin that you can actually cook them through. Actually, there are other projects also done in this. But just to give you an idea, like we were going very radical with the materiality. On the other hand, so, so we, I have been pushing research in looking at vernacular technologies with more knowledge to make the same materials go a longer way with using more ingenuity. On the other hand, I'm looking into modern, uh, into the manufactured materials, because in India we have a tug of war. We cannot use our technology to reduce the height of the building and then just sprawl, and then you spend all the energy you saved in the roads and the cars and all that. So we do, do have to, I feel, research also cement and steel, and I'm trying to minimize everywhere. So using chicken mesh, instead of big diameter steel, using very thin elements of cement, ferro-cement. So with that, uh, we have been also researching with all kinds of alternative meshes and trying to make from going from two and a half centimeters to one and a quarter and so on. So, so this is another area of research with which I have been trying because in the, you know, it has got high seismic properties and I'm, I think in the climate change we do need waterproofing, especially for very poor, poor communities, etc. And um, these are uh, kind of Lego system of uh, houses that can be assembled in a week or made into factories or moved around very easily. 
Everything is made such that four people can carry these pieces and that all of these can be produced in the backyards of Mason's home so that housing can be somehow brought back to the people. And, um, you know, so these are, you know, show, seen by you probably. This was in Venice. You see the kitchen unit, etc. They are all inbuilt. So that there's a toilet block on the side too. And some of these pieces, this is in Mike Schleich's laboratory where we have brought the craftsmen here to do as they do, but to test here and find out instead of breaking, for example, it bends, you know, you can see the ductile properties of this material. So anyhow, this is, this is a thing, ferrocement is something I'm also researching since 30 years and I think it is a very good material for the future that I'm continuing to research. Um, these are some uh, images of my material research at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art where uh, sadly nobody from outside Denmark could go because of COVID. But anyway, we have collected all those uh, examples. And I'm also looking at in situ application of ferro cement where I'm trying to build large, uh, you know, using the crease patterns to take the strength, folding the same material more to make it rigid by following some of the origami patterns. And because the formwork is so complex, I'm trying to facet the formwork and use all these Amazon cartons to recycle the, them and to be a lost formwork or remove the formwork, etc., and make formwork not a problem. You can just uh, compact those things, carry them to the disaster relief site or wherever you need shelter. So little mesh, also folded, unfolded, and then you have a shelter. So, yeah, this is a research to be done in the future. But another last bracket of research I'm doing is I also see that architecture has a tremendous potential to permanently capture urban waste because it, we always, architecture is always left behind from one generation to the ones who are born next. So architecture can absorb all that. So, you know, I've been doing um, things with almost any material from books to, uh, I don't know, glass to anything, you know, and we've, whenever we have temporary pavilions to be built for three or four months, like this one in Barcelona, uh, we have used books here, for example, just also these are playful things, but I'm also using some of the waste material in the process of construction as form work and so on. Wherever, whatever you find, use it, you know, and try to solve two problems in one, broken glass cups, etc. Absorb them in masonry, for example. And the idea that I have for students is to enable them opportunities to, you know, think with the hands. Because the more digital we go, the more analog we need in terms of our personal experience, in terms of real scale, real material, real people, and real places. Because otherwise we will widen the gap. So uh, here are students, you know, and it, many people think a one-to-one -one thing is, a, it's so mystified now. That's why all procrastination happens on the drawing board, because they don't know about the material. But if you just work with the material, in a week we have, this is the students of the AA, we had to build a tower, the tallest possible, with this material. For example, you design and build in a week, you know. Or, uh, you know, in all of these projects I showed you, you see students uh, are always there. Sometimes we have only two days, and so we use two days. This is in Mexico. We are trying to use tet Tetra Pak. We filled it back with water. I mean, even if you use it as a play tool to work in the real scale, it's very important to have this kind of opportunities inside academia because it will be very empowering for the students to allow them to play in the full scale and go scout the material. And when they talk about context, uh, to make them realize that if you don't engage in the context, don't put your hands in, you may not stumble upon a whole lot of ideas, it may pass you by, just because you are only sitting behind your computer. So, yeah. I'm just going to show some images of this work built in one-to-one -one in the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2012. But all of them also we are revisiting, you know, recycling more things, building exhibitions also, trying to build exhibitions to promote more knowledge so that by the end of the exhibition, we all have learned things that we cannot learn because the projects don't have money to actually do those tests. I'm just going to show you some different projects here. Daycare center for underprivileged children, a braille library. 
And I will end with this. Marie-Hélène, sorry, I have to bring up Roger Angers again. <laughs> you know, we have uh, this internal joke there, but okay. Um, Oroville, um, where most of my um, projects have been built in and around that area, is a project that I have uh, been involved. I, I mean, first went there, and I'm connected to Paris through this because the chief architect, Roger Angers of Oroville, he had taken ex interest in my experimentation and he entrusted me more and more areas of urban design. I landed up collaborating with him for 17 years. Eventually, I authored his monograph after he passed away, but um, he, had, he had produced the most radical concepts that time already. Uh, of the car not being allowed, you know, the 15-minute city. All these concepts were all holistically the city as an organism, including its infrastructure, etc. He had he had it all kind of figured out, and he had proposed the plan for Oroville along those lines. And uh, it was a walkable city. Many people know this image. Uh, since last year, I have been officially appointed the head of urban design, and uh, all my research that I showed you was on the material level, but I always had the intention... To, uh, to think of the large scale to create a material palette for building new cities because I come from Bombay and I'm always aware of the density problem. And when I did simple small houses, I was be thinking beyond the house as a prototype. So right now, I am building one of these very long, tall housing projects. Meanwhile, Oroville has become more green with planted trees. There are you know, some of my other projects here and there. But I'm now developing one long line of 8,000 residents in a co-housing um, scheme, but building upon Roger Angers' uh, urban ideas, but f creating the architecture and also at the same time designing the mobility for this whole city. We have uh, in, we had Jan Gale, uh, you know, coming to our studio in Stuttgart where we have been producing it. But I want to also say this because I'm s standing here in Roger Angers city. I just want to say for those of you who know him, I feel myself as a bridge between what he and his office created here in Paris. All this was produced in Paris. I find I want to be like that bridge between his generation and the next two generations. So in my students, I, t I do all these horrible projects with students so that they will be left with a with lot of hope and aspiration and confidence that they don't need to fear what our actions will leave them with. So I include them in all these projects and um, you know, we had all those student projects at Louisiana plugged into the urban design. Students from Yale, students from KADK Denmark, and students from Potsdam have been part of producing all these ideas. The challenge to them is how can you humanize the skyscraper and keep the urban scale, like the human scale, inside the... This was a main brief Roger Angers gave me that the human need for social contact and intimacy must not be removed, okay? So with this, I would um, end my talk. Thank you very much.